I thought I'd give you the full uh, version of me tonight. Welcome to Series 2, Episode 6 of The Masked Cricketer. Uh, welcome and uh, pleased that you could join us on this Tuesday evening. Uh, for our next instalment. Um, hopefully, um, we're going to have a belt tonight. I've got, I've got a great feeling about tonight. I think it'll be a, a cracker. So stay tuned for your chance to hashtag Ask the Mask. Uh, one thing I, I want to bring up uh, early doors actually tonight is we keep forgetting about the original sponsor of this uh, humble little show. Uh, and that's uh, something to do with um, Daryl Woods Cricket Coaching. Uh, no, yeah, never heard of him. no, never heard of him. Can't be any good. I, I wouldn't have thought. So, uh, yeah, just a little plug there for um, for the cricket coaching. Um, obviously, we're already um, um, trying to raise funds for the Lords Taverners. That's picked up a little bit in the last week or so. So, thank you so much for your generous donations. I haven't scrolled it down at the bottom there. At the moment, I'm scrolling our Facebook and YouTube channels because. I'd like that to be subscribed to as much as possible if you can. Obviously, there was no no warning and no singing uh, before the show tonight. I, I hear you say, thank goodness for that. Um, don't forget, Ask the Mask can be downloaded. And let's get that to number one. Come on, let's have a laugh. See, see what we can do. Just no, keep our no. away. You never know. You never know. Um, but uh, I think I'll move on to you, Kieran. Uh, it looks like uh, what you were—you've been in court today. It looks like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> a bit of a rush job, but I'm back. I'm here. I'm raring to go. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I wonder what you were dressed as. I thought it was a Christmas turkey, but I've just worked it out now. H dog. So you're obviously a hot dog tonight, aren't you? So uh, well, see, I, yeah, I do you, work these things out. You, you are bright. I tell you, very um, bright. I am. I'm very impressed with that. Very impressed. Uh, I was, yeah, I was thinking, is it a turkey? What is it? But no, I can see what it is now. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome uh, again to the Masked Cricketer. Uh, welcome to Ma Ma Matthew Barnes, who has just joined us. Sorry, uh, Daryl, I'm putting my teeth in. Welcome to Matt Barnes, uh, our boss, Daryl. Our boss has just joined us. Nice to see you. Great to see you, Matt. Um, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. As you can see, I'm totally prepared tonight. Um. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just laughing. I've just had a bit of a private chat with, uh, with our masked cricketer, and he, he's told me I look like something else. But I yeah, I was, think, I was thinking the same thing, but I, I wasn't going to mention it. I wasn't going to uh, mention it. It's even worse than you're thinking. <laughs> I'm sure. I don't think it is. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, let's crack on. So yeah, very warm welcome to episode six of series two. Uh, brilliant to have you all with us. Nice uh, nice number watching us already. Joe Cockcroft joined us despite Oxford United playing as we speak. So that's impressive. So thanks, Joe, for joining us. Um, what are we doing it for? We're doing it for the Lords Taverners. Uh, I was just about to point down there, but we haven't done it yet. But Lords Taverners in aid uh, of disability cricket. Um, if you can donate through the Mask Cricketer on our Just Giving page, please do so. Uh, as Daryl said, we've had a uh, a little bit of an uptick in the donations recently. Uh, we're not just doing it for that. We are doing it to raise awareness for what the Lord's Taverners do, the wonderful work that they do. But, yeah, please do donate if you can. Now, however small or large you can afford to give, please give um, to a, a fantastic cause. I'll get my thank yous out of the way as normal, Daryl. I'll run through them quite quickly because um, I know we've got a classic uh, mass cricket tonight. So a big thank you as ever. First of all, to Daryl was cricket coaching. Brilliant supporters for they are. <laughs> there you go. Uh, big thank you to Paul Humphreys from Pop Activation. Paul Humphreys from Pop Activation. There he is. Uh, Paul, your support has been very, very welcome uh, throughout um, both series. Big, massive thank you to Graham Woodward. Oh, you're a quick off. Crack off the draw there, Daryl. I could have said something different. Yeah, Graham yeah, Woodward from Great Minds in Summertown in Oxford. Uh, as you know, he provides a bottle of wine every week to the winner. Uh, the first person to correctly guess who the uh, masked cricketer is. Um, we've had a different winner every week, um, which is brilliant. And hopefully we'll have another, another different winner this evening. It could be another, you know, somebody could win it a second time, but who knows? Um Carrying on, a massive thank you to Sport Shots. Very good, Daryl. You don't just throw this together, do you? It's almost <laughs> like we got a script, Kieran. <laughs> oh, no, we haven't. Nothing of the sort tonight. Uh, Sport Shots, Andy and Lorna Bone, uh, as I mentioned to you yesterday, uh, brilliant uh, 
facility there, brilliant website. It's giving you all your grassroots sports coverage, which is uh, sadly lacking uh, in other ways at the moment. Um, so, yeah, please visit Sports Shots. They're one of our partners. Uh, we link to them. They link to us. Um, and thank you again to Lorna and Andy Bone. Massive thank you. Uh, I've already mentioned him once, Joe Cockroft, for letting us put our uh, shows on his channel. And a big thank you to Lindsay Penn um, from We Don't Like Cricket, We Love It. Uh, that's another fantastic Facebook channel. Uh, Joe Cockroft's channel is, of course, uh, Sports Memories Oxfordshire. So a big thank you to everybody. I'm going to say this before we crack on today, because I do put it into the comments box. If you have questions to ask, please can you put them into the comments box on Facebook Live or on YouTube. Just put the comment in, put the question in, uh, and then I can see the questions uh, and then ask them to the masked cricketer. And when the masked cricketer is unmasked, don't leave us at that moment because the whole point of it is Q&A afterwards. It's brilliant that we get the questions in, but we want to try and see as many of you as possible to stay on uh, until the end. We've got an absolute classic again tonight. Um, Daryl hasn't let us down over uh, several weeks. So, uh, yeah, make sure you stay on. Ask lots of questions and you will have full access to our masked cricketer um, when he or she is unmasked. Uh, hello to George. George, our guest from yesterday, two days away from his birthday, 21. Hi, George. That was brilliant yesterday, mate. Really good to see you. You had nearly a 1,000 people watched you, George, so you are famous. And uh, you're much more sensible than somebody dressed as a hot dog. So, uh, hi, George. Hi, Sam. Right, Daryl, without further ado, we've got a, a number of concurrent viewers. I think we can probably crack on. Now, I haven't met this mask cricketer because I've been a little bit snowed under with work, so it'll be the first for me as well. So it's going to be a uh, play-along time tonight. So uh, I'll let you go and uh, unveil the mask cricketer, Daryl. I, I will unveil. He, he or she is just getting ready, I can see. Um, and, um, yeah, please do look back at that um, promo last night with, with George Hiley. It is highly inspirational. Um, I, I've got to be honest, I had a bit of a tear afterwards because it was it was so good. So um, please go on that if, if you haven't had a chance to, because it's it's worth a, worth a watch. I have somebody at the door, Daryl, so I'm going to have to get a <laughs> uh, it'll, get a poppy. it'll be a pop poppy. Get get me a poppy, Kieran, please. Right, I'm going to introduce our masked cricketer. Here we go. Whoa, I should have done a warning before tonight's show. Oh, another scary. Oh, yeah, very scary. Um, not dissimilar to what this person looks like in real life, actually. So uh, it, it could be quite an easy one to get. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was your reflection, Daryl, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I wondered. I wondered, to be fair. Uh, Mars Cricketer, first question, as always, is our catchphrase question for Dave Freeman, who's restarting the quiz on a Friday night, actually, I just noticed. So uh, hopefully to get on that during lockdown um, is, have you ever played at Great and Little Chew, Mask Cricketer? So no, nobody's nobody's played at Great and Little Chew. Okay, dog. Um, yeah. Good, isn't it? Um, at the, <laughs> are you K Dog's twin? <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's brilliant. Uh, <laughs> have you ever played in the now what won't be for very much longer the Chewell League? Not in the Chewell League. We haven't we haven't had a Chewell League cricketer for a long time. No, have we? you haven't actually. No, that's very true. Okay, um, I will ask it because it's the league that I love. It's now um, merged with the Chewell League. Have you ever played in the Oxfordshire Cricket League, the OCA? He's thinking, what? Where's that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> why? Why would anybody? Kieran, to be honest. Yeah. I've, got I've got it in before we're amalgamated, before we're, we're one. So I'm all right. <laughs> Ian uh, Royal's not watching, you're okay. I'm fine. Okay, Mask Cricketer, uh, are you over 50? Is it somebody from Daryl's over 50 site? Are you over 50? No. Very slow and steady, isn't it? This Very one? slow and steady. That yeah. could be a clue. That could be a clue. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I, over I, 50. I'm going to ask then, are, are you still playing cricket? 
Yeah, a little bit then, a little bit. Right, that's interesting. Um, right, that's 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 cool. Have you ever played first class cricket? No, not another one, surely. Oh yes, we have. We've got another first class cricketer. Very good. Um, Kieran, you've got some questions there. Yeah, I have. We have, we'll go straight in with this one from George. George Hiley. Uh, I'll ask: Do you currently play for England? No, that was a very that was a very emphatic no there, wasn't it? That was instant no. So no, George, he doesn't currently play for England. Adam Beck's joined us from uh, Kiwi Land again. Hi, Becky. Hope you're well, buddy. I can't believe Sam's asked if he was my twin. That's really harsh. Okay, so you haven't you don't play for England. Have you ever played? So you've played first class cricket. Uh, have you ever played for Gloucestershire? Yeah. So, it's, so it's not who I thought it might be. It's not one of the tailors. Okay. I thought he looked a bit like my, Milo Hammond, actually. Very That's good. really harsh, Mervyn. That is really harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, oh, okay. are you Darren Stevens? Somebody's going yeah. straight in there. Are you Darren Stevens? We did talk about him last week, didn't we? Oh. No. no. Oh. Oh. Damn, nearly. You got so close. <laughs> So close, so close. Um, I, I wow, uh, you said mm, you're not playing for England now. Have you ever played for England at any level? It's quite a deliberate answer, mm -hmm. isn't it? So, oh, we, we've got an, we've probably got another England player here, Kieran. Well, we have possibly. Are Maybe. you Jeffrey Boycott? Looks a bit like Jeffrey Boycott, actually. Oh, should I say that? <laughs> <laughs> you just did. It's I not, not Boyks. It's not oh, Boyks. Really. Okay. Now, what we're trying to do here is keep the mask cricketer under the mask for as long as we possibly can, because it does look quite a hot one. So uh, keep yeah. those questions coming in, so we can uh, we can we can keep him under there for a little while longer. <laughs> okay, mask cricketer, are you a bowler? Are you predominantly a bowler? What was that? Is that something that came out of his nose there? Oh, that's a straw for his drink. <laughs> <laughs> so you are a bowler and you have played first class cricket. You're under 50. You've played first class cricket and you have played for England. Okay. I can't believe this is possible, but I'm going to ask Have you ever won an Ashes series? Have we got another one? Surely not. <laughs> oh my goodness me! Oh, that just—they just keep coming. They keep coming, Kieran. They do. They Convey do indeed. About. Convey about of ashes. How, how, many, how many ashes winners have we now had on? This is uh, incredible. There's quite a few. There's quite a few. So no, this, this is good. Uh, have you ever played for Warwickshire? That's a good question. Oh, I thought I thought that was a good question. Somebody just sort of retired from first class cricket. I mean, it could have been, couldn't it? Could have been Bally. Could have been Bally. Have you ever played? Oh, we had this play for Hampshire. No, we haven't had that. No. Okay. Kieran, I see there's a couple of guesses coming in. We've got a couple of guesses coming in. Are you Stephen Harmison? Bit short for Stephen Harmison, I think. Maybe. Are you Stephen Harmison? No. Not Harmy. Right. That was another good guess, actually, wasn't it? It was. Could, could have been. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm loving this. Have you ever played for Essex? You're getting these questions in quicker than me, Daryl. They're not. They're not. They're not showing on my screen as fast as they're, they're showing on yours. Yeah, they're not <laughs> popping up. Uh, they are popping up, but they're popping up after you said it. Okay, a, a new member of the group. Um, oh, I'll ask this one first. Actually, uh, okay. Richard Whittaker wants to know: Are you Graham Onions? That would go with my outfit, wouldn't it? Actually, it would. are you? Was it a clue? Uh, ah. oh, I thought I'd given a clue there. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay, so you're not going by this. Okay, are you a <coughs> excuse me? Are you a seam bowler? Okay. Have you played for the mighty Surrey? No. no. Okay. Have we you have played for Derbyshire. We're ticking these counties off, aren't we? We're ticking <laughs> <for> everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we have a new member who joined us um, today, I think. Richard Lysett, Rich Lysett. Have you ever played Sorry. for Yorkshire? We've got a Yorkie. We've got a Yorkie. We've got a Yorkie. It's got to narrow it down a bit, hasn't it? Let's narrow it down. Chris Leaney has asked, I don't think he played for Yorkshire, but I'll ask, uh, are you Chris Tremlett? Chris Tremlett's bodybuilder now isn't he not tremlet not tremlet okay. okay so you're a seam bowler you've played for yorkshire you're under 50 are you wow are you have we got darren goff is, is goffy under 50 is it goffy it's not goffy it's not goffy is he under 50 i suppose he just about is isn't he he, he would have been dancing around you know, so no, it's not golfy. I think I think we're getting a few very close guesses in. At the we're moment. getting a few very close guesses. I don't know if you want to just leave them under the mask a little bit longer. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say because uh, we've had uh, Joe Cockcroft who's given up Oxford United to watch us tonight. Are you Simon Jones? <laughs> not Simon Jones. Are you Liam Plunkett? <laughs> Go go for every single player that's ever played for England now. So. It's not Liam Plo, it's not Plunky. Okay. Uh, I, I love the spelling of some of these Plunkets as well. Brilliant. Oh, Great. guess who's joined us, Darren? I don't know if you've noticed this, but a, a, a bit of a rare occurrence here. Um, not Max Mannering has joined us. What? Max Mannering? Yeah, <laughs> he's in the house. Hello, Max. Good to see you, mate. Um, okay. Uh, we are getting some guesses in. I'm disappointed that Mark Reed hasn't guessed early tonight. He must be uh, busy doing something much more important. <laughs> Somebody's so, just asked, are you actually Ryan Sidebottom? What, again? Again? Why would we do that <laughs> twice, Marky? Did you not see two weeks ago? Uh, right. I am I think I'm going to ask the question, Kieran. I think, oh, you you? I think before you do, I will just say that we have had three correct guesses. This is controversial because I have to decide who guessed correctly first, which I will announce at the end. But we've had three correct guesses, which I was very quick to hide to not ruin it for everybody else and just to leave the mask cricketer under the mask a little while. Um, so I will let you get on with it. Mervyn's asked us to get on with it. So, Daryl, <laughs> you may you may ask the vital question as we move yeah. up to I this, this Drum roll, please. Are, are you Tim Bresnan? Ah, it's no. not, not Bres. Uh, I'm taking the Mickey. Is it the legend that is Matthew Hoggard? Oh, oh, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's Matthew Hoggard. Good evening. Yeah. Hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good stuff. I can take my uh, straw out my beer now. <laughs> Great to see you, Matthew. Warm, quite warm under there. Did we keep you under uh, there? It, it was getting a bit stuffy. <laughs> but you know what, you're you know, like, they don't turn the heating on, so it's quite nice. Uh, true. That's a good point, actually. Are you you're a little bit tight-fisted, Hoggy. You haven't got, yeah. It's, Keep, yeah. keep, keep, keep the brass dry, yeah? Yeah, we've got deep pockets and short arms. <laughs> <laughs> Same as uh, Darryl, but me and him would get on quite well, wouldn't we? Yeah, you would. nobody would ever buy a drink. It would be, you know, the phone would ring, wouldn't they, when it was your round, especially you, Kieran. Um, <laughs> Hoggy, how's it been over the last uh, few months for you? How's it been going? I, I, know, I know we had the pleasure of playing cricket together. Well, it wasn't a pleasure for you, but it was certainly a pleasure for me. <laughs> Yeah, it was um it was good fun getting out and um, actually playing sport. Um I think like everybody, very frustrating. Um at times very boring. And um 
it's it's been great being homeschooled, and, and when I say homeschooled, um, teaching Ernie maths, maths and um, science. Um, so revisiting what I, I learned forty years or thirty years ago, that's been good fun. And trying to get a business off the ground is always fantastic in um, the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> Very difficult. Yeah, good timing. Good timing, that Hoggy. That's <laughs> fantastic. Uh, Ernie, thirteen, teenager. Ernie, yeah, Ernie's thirteen. I just picked him up tonight, and he's um, he's just come back from cadets, so he's come back in full camo, and he looked like a little soldier. And all I could think of, I looked at him, I thought, you look like a person that I'd quite like to be because it looks like awesome fun and I'd quite like to dress up as a soldier and um, take the dogs out and roll around in the mud. So I was quite envious of him tonight. Oh, cool. Uh, has he got any signs of down the cricketing route, Hoggy? Is he is he going to follow in dad's footsteps? Or? Yeah, the question of do you still play? I play for the Lord Taverners, of course. Um, I'm playing for the PCA Masters when we're allowed to play. Um, but I played um, a few Saturdays and Sundays with Ernie because he's just started playing um, senior cricket. And I said, the only only way that you're playing senior cricket is if I'm playing in the same team. So I had a lovely, lovely experience of opening the batting with him. Um, I haven't actually opened the bowling with him yet. He, he He's more of a bowler, left arm bowler that swings it in. Uh, I like to stand at first slip and um, sledge him. I mean, um, sledge the batters um, and get all, all the other youngsters running after the ball. So I just stand there and shout and bark orders. It, it's it's brilliant actually batting, isn't it? With 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 your son, it's it's a great experience. It's 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 a lovely. It, it, it doesn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was, that probably brings me on to my question of your your average, your batting average. Um, do you oh, think? Well, I'll go. I'll go test match because that's a bit lower. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, it, no, I am doing a favour. You don't have to start abusing me already. You know. <laughs> well, right, right, we, we can start talk about your test average. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good one. That's fair. And, fair and, and, and then get on about what you do actually look like. <laughs> <laughs> Kieran, I'm going over to you because I can't. I've, I've, I've gone. I've gone. I think it, I'm, I'm going to be. I'm going to be really polite to you because you were one of. My, I don't want to make you sound old because I think you're the same age as me. But you were one of my heroes actually, and uh, your batting average okay the average was below 10 but you were the night watchman most of the time was that something that that you wanted to do or were you sort of press ganged into it when you were sort of oh, night watchman on a regular occasion definitely press ganged into it um it's it's getting a bit dark it's getting a bit um scary that we don't want to go out because there's no point in batting and it's quite hard to bat nowadays um who shall we send out shall we send somebody out that's actually good at batting that's equipped to do it with the technique and is in actually in the team for his batting or shall we send the sacrificial lamb out there because we don't <laughs> find out what happens to him so i i got i got um into it default and if I was batting, well, and I, I did my job and was still in the next morning, the commentators, especially Ian Botham, used to come and seek me out in the morning and say, Hoggy, well done. You've done your job. You've stayed in. Now, for f sakes, get out because I'm on commentary first and you are the most boring batsman I ever have to commentate on. So, yeah, as you say, my batting average didn't set the world alight. Neither did my stroke play. Sent the commentator. Stroke play. I saw. I saw you play a, a lovely cover drive in the Ashes series in two thousand and five, which was right out of Ian Bell's textbook, I think. So uh, I think. Yeah, I, I used to it. Doing that uh, <laughs> yeah, that was um that was a brilliant test match uh, in the middle of a brilliant series. Um, and it was, as you say, you, you were lucky enough to to see me hit a cover drive, if you can call it a cover drive. Um, <laughs> nobody else. Had. Um. It was, um, if we go back to that test match, we'd made Australia follow on for the first time in for about 19 years. And we only needed 128 runs to win. Now, uh, that's only 12.8 runs per partnership. And you get a few um, buys and a few leg buys, a few extras here and there. So you only need 12 runs per partnership. And that's exactly how many runs I needed when I had to go back. 
Now, as you've pointed out, I wasn't a great batter. So I was quite nervous walking down the steps at Trent Bridge, shaking, walked onto the grass, shaking, thinking I'm scared. And then I stood onto the grass and uh, it... It's not, it's a cliche, but everything slowed down, everything was calm because it was in my hands, nobody else's hands. And I said, you know what, this is why we do all the training, this is why we make all the sacrifices, this is why we play sports for moments like this. So everything calmed down. I walked to the middle a little bit more um, confident, thinking 12. I can edge 12. <laughs> uh, and get to the middle, and I meet Ashley Giles, a very sensible lad. I said, all right, Gilo. He goes, no. And I says, why not? He says, well, oh, Brett Lee's bowling fairly fast, and Shane Warne's turning yards. So my nurse came back fairly quickly, um, and like all senior partners, he took control of the situation. He said, look, Oggy, I'm not going to lie to you. Shane Warne's really tricky, so what we're going to do is I'm going to stay down his end, and you can have Brett Lee. And I was thinking, okay, so I get the 95-mile-an-hour bowler and you get a spinner. Fair enough. And um, Brett Lee tried to – he was either trying to kill me or bowl me a Yorker, and he got one of the Yorkers wrong. And as he said, he, he bowled me a full toss, which I've creamed through the covers, and it raced along the 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 outfield. And if it hadn't been for the 5,000 fans in the Radcliffe Road stand going, <laughs> it never reached the boundary. But I scored a four. He's the first cover drive I've ever hit for four, and most probably the last. Yeah, I remember it. I remember it to this day, Hoggy. So, can I, can I come in here? Because I, I, I'm going to try and claim myself back here, Hoggy, uh, back in your good. Um, I, I honestly, I was watching that, and I, I cannot tell you, but I did a bit of a, a, a jump, a run around my my living room when you hit that four, because it was absolutely crucial at that that stage. And it, it still, actually, when I, I watched that back, it still gives me shivers because I think it's just it's such a an important part of that. That winning, um, I have to be honest, and and uh, that partnership was just just fantastic. And I, I will be honest, that is absolutely true. I, I I was doing a jig, so hopefully I've got back into your, to your good books there. <laughs> uh, I'll step up on that, mate. Uh, I, I've got to say, actually, Hoggy, um, you, you've you've made a really good point there because I know at the time um, when, when you and Jarlo were out there batting in that match it took you took you into a 2-1 lead I remember Michael Vaughan on the balcony and he couldn't watch he was sort of hiding behind sort of barriers <laughs> and, pulse. and he said afterwards didn't he that it's a lot harder to be up in the pavilion watching than actually to be out in the middle and being under control and being in control however that is massively I mean when we came off after making Australia follow on I went and hid in the physios room I was in the physio's room hiding under the towers, getting the physio to treat me for injuries that I just made up because I couldn't watch. Uh, I didn't want to have my mind on the cricket. I was trying to get it away from the cricket. Um, listening to the wickets falling on the um, public announce, uh, public tenois analysis. And it was just so nerve wracking because, as you say, you're not in control. It's in somebody else's hands, and when it's not in your hands, it's it's more it's harder to to watch and to to think about them when you're actually in the middle, especially if somebody's um, bowling very quickly. You, you don't really have time to think about anything else. You're just trying to not die. <laughs> I mean, you've actually, you've actually answered one of the questions that's come in because Sam Sam King um, wanted to know, you know, at, particularly as a, a lower order batter, what is it actually like facing somebody like Brett Lee who's trying to knock your head off every every ball? And, you know, obviously that, that sort of pace is something that none of us would ever see at, that, at the level that we, that we play at. Yeah, you certainly um, get your adrenaline buzzing. <laughs> you certainly know that you're, you're batting. Um, it, you try, you try and train for it. You, you do go on the, you do get um, bowlers to bowl at you in the nets. You do have the bowling machine set, uh, and it's it's still. It, Brett Lee is quite a nice bowler to face from the quicks because he was very classical. You could see the ball all the way, and he didn't surprise you. Somebody like um, Malinga or Sean Tate or Shoya Bakhtar, who had different actions and not classical actions, were a lot harder to pick up because the ball was coming from different trajectory, from different angles, wasn't classical, and um, more slingshot. So I, 
they they were they were harder to face than the Brett Lee, but it is something that you trained for. Um, it's <laughs> it is something that sets your 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 adrenaline and your heart going. And as Jeffrey Boycott says, it's um, much nicer to to be at the other end than it is down at the firing end. Yeah, he used to love getting up the other end, didn't he? It's funny you should mention mm. Sean Tate. Just something just sprung to my mind when you mentioned that. Well, well, I've got I've got to mention this because. Uh, uh, Darren and I were were taking a, a county obstetrics side over to Australia in in 2010 when they won the series over there. And uh, at the uh, pedestrian crossing, um, Sean Tate was at the uh, at the traffic lights, and uh, Daryl decided to take one of his coaching cards and just stick it into his rucksack, to sort of suggest maybe that Sean Tate might have wanted some coaching. You never got a call though, Daryl, did you? Never got a call. Never got any abuse either, but um, which I should have done, uh, to be fair. But uh, it, it, it was it, we were playing over in. Um, a tour, my first tour, two thousand and one or two, to the in South Australia. We were playing the um, the, the um, Adelaide side, and I came out to bat. And he, but it was bowling gas, and he just went, "Hoggy, you block it, I'll bowl full. You play any shots, and I'll kill you." And I thought, fair enough. That's me, that's me never playing a shot again. Um, but it was good as gold. It, it didn't try and kill me once um, in that in that innings, but he had that old style bowlers union, which was quite nice. Awesome. We've got a couple of questions that have come in from George. Now, George Hiley, uh, Hoggy is um, one of our little superheroes. He's, um, he's 21 this week. He's, uh, he's one of our disability cricketers. He, he was on our promo yesterday. Uh, and I know before we ask the questions that he's asking, I know he would be absolutely thrilled if you could wish George a happy birthday for, for Thursday, bonfire night. He's 21. And he's, uh, he watches every week. So uh, I'll, I'll let you awesome. do that. And I'll ask the question. Yeah. George, have a fantastic birthday. Um, I'm sure you'll be going out and going to the pub, to a restaurant, making sure that it, it's one to remember. You won't be boring and stay in and just think, do you know what? I'll just stay in and watch a bit of TV. 21, I'll have a few beers, let my hair down. Um, so I'm sure you'll be out on the tiles with all your mates and living it up large and not having okay. a small, quiet one with your mum and dad at home because nobody else is allowed in. But, yeah, congratulations on reaching 21. Um, fantastic chat the other night. And um, wish you were, could be out having a beer. And I'm sure you'll be at a Lord's Taverners game at some point next year that we are at, and we can have a drink um, together. Yeah, he, he definitely will. He um, He's really looking forward to the, uh, the, the Lord's Taverners game against the Mars Cricketers, actually, which is on the 31st of May next year, if COVID allows. So a couple of questions he's asked. One of them... He's asked what your highest ever score was. Now, I know this courtesy of Wikipedia, but I'll let you talk about it. Um, who did you enjoy getting out the most? So your highest ever score, and who did you enjoy getting out the most? Uh, my highest ever – is this proper cricket, or is this backyard? Yeah, yard? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Is this on the computer? Um, <laughs> my highest first-class score was 89 not out. My highest yeah. test score, I think, was 39. My highest, back oh, garden, my, my highest back garden score was 3,452 um, against Ernie. Um, <laughs> it took me three days to do it, and he kept on asking if he could bat, and I said, no, you have to get me out first. Um, but, yeah, um, 89 not out first class, 39 test cricket. And who did I like getting out most? Justin Langer, because he was a brown-nosed gnome, and he was – such an annoyance and such a brown noser to his captain, Ricky Ponting, that his voice just irritated me. Um, I didn't like him on the cricket pitch. Um, and to, to boot, he was quite a good batsman. He was all right, wasn't he? Yeah, you got him out a couple of times, I think. And I'd just like to clarify that I met him off the pitch in, and he wasn't such a bad person. No, nah, uh, these, these odds are all right, aren't they? When they're not playing cricket, yeah. they're fine. Good stuff. So, um, where, who was the 89 against? Can you remember? Obviously, you can. It was, against Glamorgan. Uh, against Glamorgan. Okay. It wasn't, it yeah. wasn't against uh, Simon Jones, were you, that week? Yeah, it you? was Simon Jones, Robert Croft. Um, who else was playing? Um, Thomas. Um, I can't remember who else, but it was just, it was just Simon Jones, basically, um, taking the mickey out of him, which, yeah. was, which was brilliant. Um, no. But yeah, so, uh, getting up on your mates is always good. 
We've got we've got a, a an ex an ex Yorkshire number eleven who's who I'm sure you'll know very very well who comes on every week and he's a bit of a legend around these parts. Uh, Jack Brooks who always comes. Hey, on. Hey, uh, uh, he. <laughs> he watches every week. He's he just wants to point out he's got a hundred for Yorkshire, but there you go. He's just saying. So <laughs> he, 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 he's also got me out first ball before as well. Has he? Oh well, there you go. I'm sure we've got quite a few people out. <laughs> he was. Um... We were, play, we were playing. Uh, my, I was first the first year down at um, Leicester. And I was captain, and we'd secured we'd secured the points um, and everything else. We we didn't have a, 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 anything to prove in this game. And I said, right then, the first that I'm going to go out and try and hit a six, first ball. I, I didn't. Um, I think I had my poles uprooted. Um, Jack Brooks was was bowling, and he charged, sprinted past me, slid on his knees with his knees, going yeah. <laughs> and I just thought, who on earth is this little toad that is just celebrate? But yeah, what a play! Um, wholehearted play. Loved him. Um, but yeah, his, his, his first wicket, he just charged past me on his knees, sliding and giving it the big one. I was thinking, man. Yeah. We love him. We love him to bit. They do that at yeah. Tiddington. Yeah. Tiddington boys are all like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I've got. There's a great question coming. It's actually from a sister-in-law, um, and it, I, I'll sort of reword it a little bit. You, you've had some great bowling partners. Uh, they've asked who who you think your best bowling partner was, but I, I wondered if you'd go through a few that you know and give the sort of qualities of of those individuals as well. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I've, I've had loads and loads and loads and. And again, who was bowling at the other end really didn't bother me, um, unless it was a spinner that got through the rovers very quickly and it didn't give me a chance to have a little rest. Um, because I, I'll, I'll, I'll flat bat it first and then I'll go through the, the list of, of good bowlers that I've played in. But because cricket is such an individualistic game, nobody else can do anything until the bowler has let go of the ball. So it didn't matter what the other bowler had done um, because you were now in charge of delivering what you had to do. It was nice if you could bowl well in tandem, but I don't think it was completely necessary. Um, if you had the the mindset of putting the ball where you wanted to put it, it didn't, it didn't matter what was happening at the other end. But to, to open the, the bowling with the likes of Darren Goff, with the likes of Alan Donald, with the likes of Steve Harmison, um, just, to, just to, name, to name three off the top of your head, loved Goffy, um, wholehearted cricketer, running was the catalyst of anything. If the times got tough, you could always rely on Goffy to put his hand up and say, right, then I'm bowling. Um, not the tallest in stature, smaller than me. I'm six foot two and he was five foot eight, I think. <laughs> he'll, he'll have a go at me for that. Um, but yeah, but again, quick out swinger, um, wholehearted cricketer, whereas opening the bowling with Alan Donald, what an absolute legend he was. Um, scared people with his raw pace and uh, and he was very quick. Um, so, and then with Steve Harmson with the pace and bounce and everything. And when you look back at the, the what we would call the Fantastic Four, um, with myself, Steve Harmson, Simon Jones, and um, Andrew Flintoff, Steve Harmson, tall and bouncy and horrible to face. The Simon Jones, rapid, swung the ball both ways, reversed it, very skiddy at 90 mile an hour. Andrew Flintoff was horrendous. And then there was just little floaty old me that used to come out and, and try and swing it out gently. So all the batters were thinking, where on earth am I getting another run from? We'll have a go at Hoggy. And managed to pick up a few wickets off the back of that, I would have suspected. Brilliant. I, 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 George, I think George has just asked... Um, uh, are you a football fan? And if so, who 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 do you support? Um, no, I'm not a football fan. I cannot stand the way that footballers behave on the pitch. Um, effing and blinding, falling over the shoelaces, clutching their arms like they've had the broken arm when nothing even hit them. Um, they're the role models for our children. And every Saturday they're swearing at referees and effing and blinding. I can't be doing with it. They try and get the opposition sent off. Um, and I just, I can't be doing it. You look at the rugby rugby guys who are a lot bigger and a lot tougher and a lot harder sports. Say yes sir, no sir to the referee. If they give them any bat chat, it's 10 yards. If they do it again, they're off. Um, and I, I just, I think the footballers have a, 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 a thing to make sure that they're acting correctly for our for our children to look at. 
and you can see the the difference between a rugby side and a football side on a Saturday morning. The parents behaving like they do, swearing at the referees, swearing at each other, having a go at the kids at the side of the pitch. And I just don't think it's the right standards and the right morals and the, the right attitude to be bringing up children. So I don't follow a supporter. And if it if I did, it'd have to be dirty leads. <laughs> Yeah. There's a few dirty Leeds fans on actually, so uh, pretty much with you there, Hoggy. To be honest, um, I've had a few experiences of of actually um, refing a you know an under tens game, and the parents are, are, are worse than the kids. It's it's. Uh, yeah. And yeah. and if you go to the school teachers as well, if they play football on a Saturday and rugby on a Sunday, on a Saturday the the kids turn up with a horrible stinking attitude. They think the world owes them. They'll chat back to the teacher. They'll leave things around, and they're a bit horrible to deal with. On a Sunday, there is a totally different kid playing a different sport, and because they're playing a different sport, to to change their attitude and their characteristics, I, I think that's what is wrong with with football. Um, and and I, 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 I yeah. I'll, I'll I'll stop talking how bad I hate football, but I do. I hate it. Fair play, fair play, Kieran. I know you've got a few questions coming in. I know you want to ask uh, Hoggy a few few of your own. So over to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to go back. Um, not not to the start of your career. I, I want to go back to um, that year, two thousand and five, Hoggy. Um, I mean, we can talk about the start of your career uh, uh, later as well. But two thousand and five, for you personally and for England, was was a huge year, wasn't it? I, I'm talking about your your best figures in South Africa, and then obviously the Ashes series. That must have been a, a time in your life that you look back on with with unbelievable pride, really. Yeah, massive. Um, if you look in 2004, we'd gone through the year unbeaten. Um, it was a the start of something special. Um, the year NASA, I think, re resigned in 2004. Michael Vaughan took over. And I think NASA and Duncan Fletcher had done a lot of the donkey work and, and created a nucleus of people that they wanted to, to play a big part in English cricket. They'd taken it from a soft-bellied, um, not-so-fit England side to a, a side that, 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 that trained well and were were looked after by the ECB with a central contract. And we, we used 2004 as a, as a platform for 2005. We went to um, the West Indies and we won in the West Indies for the first time in, I think it was 30 years, um, away from home. Um, Steve Harmson picking up seven for 12 um, as a, a, with everybody behind the bat except for short square leg who was in front of it. It was a particular memory. Um, and then in 2005, coming against the Australia side who had been dominant in the all the way through the late 90s, early 2000s, um, to say, right, we've got a great chance of, of beating you, um, was a massive summer. And just to, to skip ahead, people that have watched a lot more cricket than I have and commentated on it said it's one of the best series, if not the best series that's ever been. I was very lucky enough to be a part of that and to have that inner knowledge of what we did and say, right, then we're going to stand up to Australia. We're not going to get bullied. And after winning um, or losing the toss at, at, at Lords and bowling Australia out for less than 200 and hitting them everywhere, we hit. Um, Matthew Hayden, we hit Langer, we hit, I don't know when I say we, um, Steve Harmison hit Ricky Ponton, he hit Langer and he hit Hayden um, and set the set the tone for the series and we bowled them out twice for less than 20, uh, for, well we got 20 wickets in the game um, and we only narrowly lost that game by 165 runs which was quite good for England against Australia at the time um, and we, we saw the emergence of Kevin Peterson, who uh, at times were making his debut in a test arena, dance down the wicket and smack Glenn McGrath straight back over his head into the pavilion at Lord's. And everybody's jaws dropped and said, you can't do that to Glenn McGrath. He's a world, <laughs> one of the world's best bowlers. And Kevin Peterson came in with a breath of fresh air um, and showed a different mentality against Australia. And we went back to, to Edgebaston with the thinking that we're going to get a little bit of a, a rollicking for, for giving our wickets away a little bit too easily against uh, the Australia side. And Michael Vaughan says, you know what, we need to put pressure back onto the Australian bowlers. We need to put them under the pump a bit like KP did. And, and he could see our batters thinking, you're right, Glenn McGrath, Jason Gillespie, Brett Lee and Shane Warne. 
which one's the weak link and which one we're going to go after to, to put the pressure back on. And it was a massive thing when um, Glenn McGrath stood on the, that ball, uh, um, Edge Baston twisted his ankle and got carried off on the back of a golf cart. And you could see all our batters giving each other low fives and high fives. And I know you're not supposed to like or want the opposition to, to get injured, but I tell you what, there was 11 people very happy that Glenn McGrath wasn't playing in the next test match. And our batters were thinking, hmm, Michael Kaspervic, <laughs> we'll have a go at him. And that's exactly what they did do. And with Ricky Ponting winning the toss at Edge Baston, and saying, right, then because England batted so poorly in the second innings at Lords, we think they're a little bit fragile, we'll have a bowl first. And it was a good batting track at Edge Baston. It, was, it looked quite fairly flat. They just lost his best opening bowler on the back of a golf cart with a, with a dodgy ankle. He came back into the um, changing rooms and we heard exactly what Shane Warne thought about his decision to bowl first was. He was effing and blinding at him and calling him all the names under the sun. And we went out and scored 400 runs in the first innings, in the first day at uh, Edge Baston. We lost 10 overs to, to bad light. And we scored 400 runs in 80 overs against Australia. And that was sort of the the marker we'd put down after after performing below average with the bat at, um, at Lutz. And we could go on because that was just the the, 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 the first um, <laughs> the first um, test match in a, uh, the first day um, of that series. Yeah, I thought I thought that, that that first day of the second test, that I, I know that McGrath wasn't there, but you still had three exceptional world class bowlers. And I think that really set the tone for the rest of the series, didn't it? And I, I thought one of the one of the key moments of that series was was seeing Australia celebrate a draw at Old Trafford. That was for me, that that to me at, at that time of my life, I thought, well, you've got them. You know, they're celebrating a draw. This is the mighty Australia. Yeah. What did you think? What did what did you guys yeah. think when you saw that? That's exactly what I, I say. And if we'd have lost that test match at Edgebaston, I think we might have been on the on the back of a 5-0 whitewash. But winning at Edgebaston by that massive total by two runs. Um, we went, as you say, we went to Old Trafford and we had the better of the test match and we needed to bowl them out on the last day again. Uh, Ricky Ponting scored 160. Fantastic um, captain's knock. And after... After we didn't beat them, they were nine down. And after Steve Harmison bowled the last ball and they, they managed to hold out, as you say, they celebrated a draw. They were high-fiving, hugging and kissing like they'd won the game. And sometimes when you're going to win and you don't quite get there, it's worse than losing because you you think you, you build yourself up, we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. Whereas if you're going to lose, you put up the defensive barriers. It wasn't our fault. It was the batter's fault. Always the batter's fault or the umpire's fault or the weather's fault or we had the worst of the thing. But to, to think you're going to win and then don't, you, the rug's pulled out from underneath you, you sink, your head goes down, your shoulders go down and you think we might have blown our chance of beating Australia for the first time. And Michael Vaughan saw that pulled us into the middle um, at Old Trafford. And people ask me who's the best captain I've played under. I always say Michael Vaughan. Not because he was so tactically astute or he was a, a fantastic batter. He was a great man manager. And he could see that everybody had slumped and everybody's was head down. And he pulled us into the square at Old Trafford and pointed at the Australian dressing room and said, look how they're celebrating a draw. They were talking about a 5-0 whitewash when they first came to these shows. And here they are celebrating a draw against us. And his exact words were, we've got them by the ding-dang-doos. We are going to go on and win the series. And that, to me, when the, the mighty aura and the invincibility of the Australian team just went, there were 11 players with the same frailties, with the same insecurities that we had. And that was, to me, was the big changing, changing philosophy. The biggest mindset in that test series was that, 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 that little moment at Old Trafford where, where as you say, we, we saw them in a different light. And it really, um, the, the, the series in general really got the, uh, you know, the, 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 the juices going within England. I mean, I'm thinking again of the, the lockout at Old Trafford where they were queuing down the road. And it, it was the series that really generated interest. I know it was the last series on terrestrial television and, and Channel 4, but the, the series in general, just A, because it was such a fantastic series, but also the, the, the first win over the Aussies since the mid-1980s. It was just, 
everything about that series was was perfection, wasn't it? Really. Uh, apart from our first first test match, <laughs> um, but yeah, it encapsulated the nation. There were so many um, ebbs and flows, ups and downs. Um, that made it into a, a great series, and it, uh, for some reason, it encapsulated encapsulated the nation. Um, we were on front page, back page, middle pages of the newspaper. People were stopping work to listen to it, to watch it on the TV. The the golfers. They didn't have the leaderboards up anymore. They had the cricket on. And there was no football. There was no rugby. There was no athletics on to, to take away from what that summer was about. And it, as you say, it was still on terrestrial TV. Everybody was watching it. And it, we'd never seen that before. And it did fantastic. It did wonders for for, for um, cricket. And it got a lot of people watching. And as you say, I still get people that, that say thank you very much you, you 2005 was fantastic and the the older generation say thank you very much the younger generation are saying you're the reason that i started playing cricket for 2005 and that to me is the biggest buzz you can ever get somebody coming up to you or coming up to say you're the reason i started playing cricket makes you feel very old because they're sort of like 20 plus and, <laughs> and you're thinking well how old must i be um but yeah to to, to leave that legacy because you, you want you want to leave behind a legacy as a team you want to be leave behind something Thing to be remembered and 2005 was definitely on some everybody's radar as a cricket fan and it is still something that people keep on coming up to you and saying thank you even 15 years later i've just worked out you're not that old hoggy you're only three days older than me i've just worked that out. i've just looked i'm older so... than you you must have yeah. had a bad paper around mate uh... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, just before I hand back to Daryl, so as players, then did you, you presumably you you knew um, you know how important and, and what role models you were, and, and how important your sort of form and your performances and the victories. You knew how important that was for the future of cricket in in, in England, because as you say, um, you know it, it inspires people, doesn't it? Yeah, but at the time, you you don't think that way. It is day, session after session, day after day, ball after ball. And it's only when you, it's been and gone, you had time to reflect and you, you, the years have gone by that you realise how important it was. Um, but the, I think the biggest thing that hit you in that 2005 was when we, we were sillyly allowed to go around London um, the day after we'd won at the Oval in an open tour bus. Um, and the amount of people that turned up to, to to see us, that was the sort of biggest sort of like telling point of how important that series was for a lot of people. Absolutely. I, I just uh, realised we haven't plugged the, the Lord's Taverners for a little while. Um, obviously, it's scrolling down the bottom there, guys, what we're doing this for. Please... Um, donate if you can give generously if you've enjoyed um hoggy's stories about certainly the ashes 05 which is is just fantastic uh, to hear um oh hang on a second sorry i've got a call coming in uh, uh yeah ricky yeah uh yeah we got gary pratt on instead of you mate so uh <laughs> don't, don't worry about that um we'll, we'll come back to you we'll come back to you okay yeah thanks thanks for watching <laughs> Every just, week. just every time it just pesters um, <laughs> um, we might have them one day we, we do we do uh, I was going to come on uh, quite nicely Hoggy a few questions about um, your career um, 34th person to get a test match hat trick who were your three I know it was West Indies who were your three um, Shrivna and Chandapur no no Ramna Rashawan, um, Chanda Paul, and Ryan Hines. Not a bad three. Uh, not a bad three. Not bad, not bad. Um, Chanda Paul, second. That was the biggest wicket, I think. So, what was it? Um, Sarwan. Um, Ronnie Sarwan, I bowled him an half volley, and he sneaked it to gully. Um, bad, bad foot mo movement, couldn't be bothered. Bad work transfer. Um, then in came Shivnarayan Shandapal, and I thought, you know what? First ball, swing it back into him, we'll get him LBW. 
and that's exactly what happened. I uh, swung it back into him, um, absolutely salmon. And then Ryan Hydens came in, another left-hander. I thought, absolutely fantastic. I'm going to swing it back into him as well and get him LBW or bold. And I got a little bit too excited, man. <laughs> my beans were going high. I ran in a little bit too too quickly. I lost my action a little bit and pushed it across him. And he was expecting it to swing in. I was expecting it to swing in. And it just held its line and uh, he sneaked it to second slip. And Freddie didn't make any mistakes. And I got a hat trick. So the ball that I tried to bowl wasn't the ball that I heard that I bowled for my hat trick. So if I don't know where they're going, the batsmen definitely don't. But if you put it in the right area, <laughs> it's all right. I just got a almost, almost the perfect <laughs> ball for, for a hat trick, I would suggest. If you don't yeah. know where it's going, you got a no, chance. Well, I was it, trying to bowl a different one. <laughs> and it's nice that you executed your skill for Chanderpool, though. You know, that, that's yeah. that quality. Brilliant. It, it was uh, Bane in our backsides. Yes. I was just saying, Daryl, it's quite interesting that because <laughs> your old mucker, Ryan Seibarm, talked about his hat trick the other day and he said that he, they were all really. Bad deliveries and long ops. <laughs> so at least you actually executed some skills there. So. Yeah, did did I not catch one on the boundary with a flying leap? I can't remember if that was if that was part. Of it. it was the same game. I can't remember if it was part of the hat trick or not. I think it may have been. Yeah, yeah. he did mention it was a long hop that got caught in the deep. So it must have been. Yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. that, do you know what? That bugger is. Hat trick! That catch was awesome. I was running around <laughs> left. I had to jump up in there and take it above my head. Land. The go where the, the, the ropes were. Yeah, hurt my knee on the landing. Um, but yeah, that was an awesome one of the best catches I've ever caught. Never minded oh, that trick. Better than that. We'll, we'll brush over his hat trick. It was the 37th one anyway. Okay, you got the 34th. Come on. Oh, well, can you name the two in between then? I don't know actually. I must I must find that out, mustn't I? I I've right, I've got researchers to, to look at that. I, I want to take you back actually, because I, I it was it was interesting talking to Sam Northeast last week, um, saying that some of some of the hardest cricket he played was in the Harrow and Eton uh fixture at, at Lords. He said that could be quite quite tasty. I wondered what it was like in the Bradford League when you started out. What what was it like in that league? Yeah, there was quite a few characters, quite a few sledging. Um, yeah, I don't. I think I think it might have been on a different um, level between Harrow and Eton and Pudsey versus Pudsey. <laughs> I think yeah, I don't. I don't I might not just have had the same flavour or the same twang about it. Um, a lot of it I won't repeat here. Uh, but yeah, my uh, yeah, and um, there was a lot of lot of lot of sledging going on. My I can remember my first ball I bowled in the Bradford. Well, to, to one of the, the Yorkshire second team, it was called Chris Pick at the time. I'd just got a wicket and he strolled to the crease and asked the other batsman what he was doing. He said, oh, he's swinging it out. And my first ball, he smacked me over cow corner of the nets at, um, at, at Pudsey Kongs. He just came down, tapped, he went, anti-swing device, son. And I've just gone, bop. I didn't know what to do about it. I bought my best ball and he just deposited me over there. But yeah, there was a lot of sledging, but most of it was um not PC enough to 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 broadcast on a on a podcast. <laughs> I like it. Um I, I was going I mean tough league, I, I'm I'm guessing. Uh I, I'd like to have had a, a little sample of that at some point. Yeah, uh, you look at the Bradford League, uh, Yorkshire's the biggest county. Um, it's got a lot of cricketers, and the Bradford League was the best league in in inside Yorkshire, and we had a lot of, of professional players play. Um, I played with the likes of VVS Laxman, um, Yusef Yohana. Um, there was one point where everybody at Pudsey Kongs had played at least second team cricket, if not first team cricket for Yorkshire. Um, I so yeah, it was um it was a fantastic league. And it, it grew up. My first Bradford League wicket was Graham Roop, <laughs> which, which was fantastic. And in the same same game, um, I got Ashley McCaff out as well, who was, who was in the same team. But if you think you're playing against a, a current Yorkshire first team, an ex-England international, um, they had a, an overseas Simon Dool who played in, in our league. Um, there were so many players that had got, well, went on and, and played great cricket or had played great cricket. Oh, you know, a good good grounding for you then. I, I'm guessing. Was what was your best sledge there against you or or <laughs> maybe from you? Come on, can you can uh, you on that? 
there's two sledges that spring to mind. Um, um, most of, both of them, not actually on the cricket pitch. Um, Steve, one to Steve Armisen. It was in 2006, seven when we'd been hammered by Australia. Ricky Ponting had scored a century. And there were me, myself, James Anderson, and Steve Harmison that was the, the seamers. Now, I went out and warmed up first. And as I walked out, one of the crowd said, Oi, hold on, you're the worst bowler in history. And I thought, fair enough. I started warming up. James Anderson came out and went, Oi, Anderson, you're the worst bowler in history. And I thought, fair enough. And then Harmison came out 10 minutes later because he was always last. And he came out and this voice piped up and we thought, oh, yeah. And he went, Oi, Harmison, the only good thing about you is your missus. And Steve <laughs> Harmison turned round and went, if you like her so much, you try living with her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that was a, a brilliant comeback. And the other one was from my wife. Um, happened in the kitchen. Um, it was the, the year that I went on to MasterChef and I... I did a bit of MasterChef, so I thought I was a pretty good cook. So when I walked into the kitchen after I'd done a day's filming and she was watching Gordon Ramsay on the TV, I said to her, why on earth are you watching a cookery program for? You can't cook. And as quick as a flash, she turned around and went, well, you watch porn? <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, there's absolutely no way of coming back from that. <laughs> yeah, that's well and truly own, that is, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty damn, pretty damn. <laughs> I, I um, actually that brings me on because I think Mervyn's asked a couple of questions, which I will bring to you. Uh, the funniest drinking experience on tour? Oh wow, um, pass. The too many to to yeah. to, to, uh, to remember. Um, yeah, I think I think the the, the comments of um, you don't remember me, do you? And you go, no. And they say, well, I bought you a drink in 2004 in a bar in Barbados. And you're thinking, yeah, okay, that's sort of like 16 years ago and most probably I was pie-eyed. Um, but, yeah, I get a lot of people saying I bought you a drink in a bar and not being able to remember the night. And for that, I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah, there was quite a lot of drinking incidents, um, apparently. <laughs> Can't remember any of them. <laughs> well, it's it's a horrible one when you're trying to think of a funny incident that's happened. You, your mind goes blank and everything goes out of the the window. Um, calling Tony Blair a knobhead that that's quite quite good. But that was after the 2005 when we've been on the the Raz for 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 a while. Um, yeah, ah, and um, Steve Armisen painting TWAT on. Freddie's forehead, um, Ashes winners 2005 and CUNT on another cheek and all over. And him being on breakfast TV the following morning with his face bright red. Um, Knowing full well that it was, uh, he said it was a, a shower to wake himself, cold shower to wake himself up in the morning. And I knew it was Neil Fairbrother and a gallon of turp scrubbing the indelible ink off his forehead. Brilliant. Oh, that must have been a great experience on that that double open double decker. Yeah. Oh, it was amazing. I can't remember. I can't believe how many people turned up to watch us. Superb, wasn't it? Like the whole of England was out on the streets of London, Hoggy, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, oh, it was incredible. Can't believe it. It was, uh, yeah. Uh, and the wives wives were there as well. That was um, that was another experience. Freddie got the biggest slap I've ever seen. He had, he had a little child, Holly. Um, it, was, it, was, it was his firstborn. And he did a Michael Jackson. And he had Holly, and he was dangling him over the front of the bus. And Rachel, his wife, stormed off, nicked Holly, and just went whack on his face. <laughs> that was quite amusing because <laughs> it didn't happen to me. But yeah, it was, but it's amazing how much we got away with on that. that that day after, two days after uh, 2005. If we'd have done it now, we'd have been hung, drawn and quartered. But at the time, everybody was so delighted that we'd won. They are just, ah, it's just lads letting their hair down. Just let them enjoy it. But, yeah, you look back at it now and the faces and what and what we looked like on that open tour bus was, was um, something to behold. Uh, I think it was the first true. time in 18 years, wasn't it? So it deserved to celebrate. Um, and that was our excuse, and I'm still sticking to it. 
Quite right, so quite rightly so. I, I know Kieran's desperate to ask a few uh, quick fire questions. I'll go over to him in a moment. Um, we have gone past the hour, so thank you again for one for coming on our humble show and also agreeing to do this. Uh, it, it's been uh, much appreciated. Um, but you mentioned Master Chef there. Um, obviously, you've got this this passion for cooking. Um, tell us a little bit about the new venture hoggy's grill uh, how's that come about and uh, what are you looking to do i know it's the wrong time at the moment but how's it going and what what's what's planned for the future yeah so hoggy's grill is um it's a cookery school barbecue cookery school that um teaches people to get the best out of their grills and to learn how to cook properly outside um with the great flavors of wood and charcoal um we're based up in rutland water um it's not the not the but worst time because Christmas is coming up and Christmas turkeys on the on the grill it tastes far more succulent and more flavour in them than you do when you've cooked them in the oven and it frees up your oven a little bit of space um, but I think the flavours you get from from fire um, and cooking on fire is so much nicer than cooking on gas or in the oven um, so that's that's where my passion comes from my passion came from touring South Africa when I was 18 where all they wanted to do every night was to bry flace which is cook on on wood and they cook on things called Camille Duran or Mapani which is um, hardwood and I retired in 2013 I tried my hand at um, foreign currency a um, bit of um, insurance I've dabbled into coaching somebody says you need to find something that you're passionate about and I said what like eating and drinking and they said, yeah, and that's where Hoggy's Grill um, sort of like was born of the idea. And now we've got a lovely spot overlooking Rutland Water, which is a fantastic um, view. And we teach people, as I say, to, to have a have better barbecue experience and to cook any, I've baked cakes, I've cooked Yorkshire puddings on, on barbecues. And we do it in a nice relaxed atmosphere um, with a beer in hand um, or a glass of wine. And it is, I, I absolutely love it. As you say, it's been quite tough because of the the restrictions and COVID and the lockdown. Um, but we're we're going to be putting things online. We're going to have um, a lot of events next year, and we're um, looking forward to to taking the barbecue world and the al fresco dining by storm. I think it sounds a really great venture, and we wish you all the very best for that. I'm, I'm sure it will go very well. Um, I, I, I'm absolutely convinced of that. Is Sarah heavily involved in that as well? Is Sarah heavily involved in it as well? Of course. She, she owns it. Um, but, and if you, yeah, if you want to have a look at photos or anything, hoggiesgrill.com. That's where you'll find everything. Um, we're online and we can you can see what we're up to. And you can decide, don't do it before you're hungry, though, because there's some good-looking meat and some food out there. Um, and you'll be trying to lick your screen. Um, so, But, yeah, the, we've got we've got a lot, whole host of courses to, to come on. Um, and, yeah, have a look, see what you think, and buy some gift certificates. Brilliant. There, that's the sale pitch. Um, no, great stuff. Like I say, we wish you all the best with that. I know Kieran's um, wanting to come in with a few quick fire questions as, as we've gone past the hour. He's chomping at a bit there. Like, he's, he's, I'm, he's, chomp I'm, I'm chomping at a bit because, Hoggy, I've seen some of the images from your Hoggy's Grill. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm somebody that quite likes my food. You could probably tell that. I've got about five chins. <laughs> and, uh, it does look absolutely amazing. We've shared a few things um, previously across the group, and we'll continue to do that because it does look incredible. And, uh, yeah, really genuinely best of luck with that because uh, it's obviously a passion that you've got. And, uh, yeah. Um, and as if, more if ever you're Gonna have a, we're gonna have a golf day up there and um, an eating and drinking competition. So you need to oh, get your you need to get your drinking shoes, eating shoes, and golf shoes out, and you can come up and we can have some great food, some good banter on the golf course, and enjoy. We even make um the people there we even make their own gin. So we've got Rutland gin to um to to try and taste as well. Sounds awesome. Are you mobile by any? Are you mobile by any chance? Because I'm just thinking with our with our um, game next year, which is the 31st of May, we're going to plug that again. If you're mobile, or if you can get mobile, perhaps if you're not oh, doing anything do. that day, you could come down and uh, show us what you can do. We we are mobile. Uh, I've just been asked to quote for my first wedding as well. Oh wow. He wants me to cook for my wedding, so yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I can be mobile, so we we can chat about that. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. If if you can 
check in your diary and put a date in your diary. We've got the 31st, a little uh, little invite there for you. And we've already, we've already had Ryan Sidebottom and, uh, and Charlotte Edwards have committed to come along. I'm not, not, not putting you on the spot, but uh, if you're... I'm, a, uh, I'm as quick as running now as Charlotte Edwards was. What was that? Sorry? I think, I, I think I'm as quick at running now as Charlotte Edwards is. Her, yeah. her, knees, her knees and my knees are on the same par. Yeah, well, side, side bottom's coming out of retirement to, to, to apparently have a crack at playing in that one, and apparently Brooksy may be there as well. So if, if you're at a loose end and you have uh, and you can bring your wares down, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Definitely get you on the field as well, Hoggy, I think. We'll get you on the field, definitely. I'm cooking. You might have to watch Daryl uh, You might have to watch Daryl back no, again. He then. doesn't want to watch that again. I can well, it. That, it won't take very long, and if it does, I, I'd just sleep. Because it was quite boring, to be fair. To to say that he only had sixteen year olds bowling at him, he was so boring. It was unbelievable. And it wasn't a case that he'll score a few runs and then come off and let somebody else have a go. It's not nah, my game, I'm batting, and if the game can't get me out, I'm staying in. I think he takes the leaf out of his book, I think, definitely. Actually, Augie, if my family are watching, they're saying he was like that as a kid, you know. <laughs> But he's more, you know, he was never out, so nothing's changed in, in 50 odd years. <laughs> never out, <laughs> should have played a bit more then. Look, the, funny, the funny thing is, Hoggy, that not to me. <laughs> the, the funny thing is, because you were there and you were witness to it, you're now telling us everything that we thought was the case. Daryl was told us what a fantastic innings it was, you know, free, free flowing, and you know, lots of cover drives, and then you come on and tell the truth. So that's good you to know see. That's <laughs> Poggy, a couple of a couple of quick fire questions to, uh, that, have, that have come in, and they will be quick, Mervyn. I promise. Uh, so uh, we sort of touched on one of them already. Um, who who was the most fun off the field in the England teams that you played? And, and if you can answer this, who was the hardest to get on with? Oh wow, wow, we were. Um, there was a lot of fun people. Um, Andrew Flintoff springs to mind. Um, Ashley Giles springs to mind. Fun off the field. Uh, Simon Jones, Steve Armstrong. They were they were all great people to be off with. Um, hardest to get on with. Ah, I'm going straight in with Kevin Peterson. <laughs> this is a shock. <laughs> why? Why was that? Because uh, he was a hot to us. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> and uh, another question you, you talk about facing Brett Lee did you find Brett Lee or Shoeb Akhtar more terrifying to face did you face much of Shoeb I did face Shoeb um, and depends whether as I said Brett Lee was quite nice because you could see him all the way and he was consistently fast and you never knew whether Shoeb was bowling it or throwing it so if he was bowling it it was alright because that was only sort of like 80 mile an hour and when he threw it he threw it at 95 so you never knew which which one was coming down. So uh, Shoei was a lot more difficult to face. Good stuff. Yeah, no, that I, I, he always struck me as uh, he's the first bowler I think that was officially clocked at 100 miles an hour, wasn't he? Whether it was a throw or whether it was a proper delivery. <laughs> yeah, I think Brett Lee and him did it in the same year. Um, and we, we, we saw him in warm-ups and he bowled just as quick off a short run-up as he did from a full run-up. Um, we always ask the question, why on earth do you run up so far um, when you can bowl as quick off a short run? And show up said, people watch me to, to run in. And I said, no, <laughs> they want you to watch you to bowl quickly. And you can only bowl quickly for four overs off that long run up. Depends on how quick you can bowl, how long you can bowl off a short run up. <laughs> yes, indeed. I think Fred Truman used to come off a pretty long run as well, didn't he? He used to say the sight screen got in the way. So, <laughs> so I did Whispering Death. Absolutely, yeah, Daryl. That's um, that's the, the the questions I've got here. So um, uh, from me, Matthew, I just want to say um, sorry that I didn't uh, get a chance to meet with you earlier. I was rushing around today, but uh, really fantastic to have you on the show. Really, really appreciate your time. We we have gone um, sort of well over the hour as we normally do. We always say it's an hour, but we always we always drag it on a little bit. But for for me, it's been it's been brilliant. You are, you know, believe it or not, you are slightly older. I, mean, I know I know it looks like I'm probably <laughs> most of age. But no, you are actually genuinely one of my uh, cricketing heroes because uh, the Ashes in 2005 was probably around about the time that I was really getting into cricket, actually. Um, you know, I was quite late into it and uh, watching that series really did inspire me. It hasn't inspired me to be any good. I'm still crap, but uh, <laughs> it inspired me to at least get more involved in cricket. And uh, it's down to people like yourself, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, from me, thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for joining us tonight. It's been brilliant. Thank you very much for having me. It's been enjoyable.
Um, wise words, Kieran. Thank you for that. Um, I've got two or three questions for you, Hoggy, if you don't mind. Um, just staying right. with us for a little while. And um, white and two sugars. <laughs> I've got um, superpower. If you had a superpower, what would it be? You can have a think about that. It'd have to be, have to be flying. No, I don't flying. think flying. Love to be able to fly. Brilliant. Love that. Um, the Yorkshire Leicester transition, but being captain at, at Leicester, was that a tricky time of your career? Was it enjoyable time to, to skip her? What, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, very enjoyable. Um, I didn't really go down to be to be the captain to start with. Um, I went down to work with um, Tim Boone, who I thought was a fantastic coach. And in my first, in my first year, um, Tim Boone had resigned. The chairman or the CEO had resigned, and the me and the chairman had a massive falling out. And we had um, a very public row, and it was either him or me. So, my it wasn't the most enjoyable time <laughs> of my life. But we we managed to win um, a T20 uh, in 2010. We we won it for the third time as, as a small county at Leicester, which was a fantastic. Um, a feeling um, to, to win a domestic trophy as a captain was, was really, really, uh, one, really up there with the achievements uh, of my domestic career. So, yeah, I really enjoyed the getting to know people and getting to know myself a little bit more um, as, a, as a leader. And if I if, if I could do it again, yeah, I'd, 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 yeah, I would. Um, but, uh, yeah, very enjoyable. Let's stop rabbiting. Cool. No, that's brilliant. And the last one from me, and I'm, we've sort of forgotten to ask this over the last few weeks, and it's it's good if some of the young players that are watching, um, is there any advice that you can give to a young fast bowler, um, you know, trying to get into, you know, perhaps adult cricket or even, you know, beyond? What what advice could you give them? Yeah, I'm going to say the, the biggest piece of advice that I always give is that you're in control of the game. And if you can put the ball where you want to put the ball, um, you, you, you're in a chance of winning. And what's the difference between an attacking bowler and a defensive bowler? Um, attacking bowler will try and hit the top of off as many times as he can with four clips and a gully because he's got every mode of dismissal Um to him, he can hit the stumps. He can get LBW. He can still get caught behind, which is or caught, which is the big three. Um, and then, what's the difference between a defensive bowler? Well, a hard ball to hit is a ball that hits the top of off. Um, but you hit the top of off with a ring field, five four field, and you've done absolutely nothing different. You you you're still bowling the same ball because. Batsmen get themselves out. It's very rarely that a bowler bowls a ball that makes the batsman unplayable. So you've got to make the batsman make a mistake. And if you can ask questions of him every ball, he'll make a mistake sooner rather than later. And that is if you play forward, backwards, play it, leave it, attack it or defend it. Every ball, he's got his thinking, he's challenging his technique. And it's a, a big mindset about um, who's going to be first, you or the batsman, because every time you bowl a bad ball and he gets off the mark or he hits a four, um, the pressure's back on you. Whereas if you're building the pressure all the time, uh, he's going to he's gonna play a rash shot um, sooner and then you, you get the wicket. So they make a mistake, you don't get wickets is the mindset that I, I used to be. Don't get bored before the um, batter, isn't it? You know, yeah. uh, um, my, other, my other big is don't blame the coach, blame yourself. Don't say that I didn't have the throwdowns, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, or the coach didn't do that. There's only one coach, there's 11 players or 12 players. If you need to make sure that you've done all the work that you have to do, you don't have to be told, you don't have to be the hand held the hand to, to do the things, you've got to got to make take the onus on yourself and make sure that you've done all the work um, to get yourself in, in the prime position. Absolutely wise words. And we we dropped Kieran. I wasn't going to bring Kieran back on. I thought that would be quite a good because he'll cut him I, I, seven I'll questions. Tell you what, I'll tell you what happened, Daryl. I I was re I just read Hoggy's backstage comment and then nearly fell off the chair in laughter and then knocked the phone off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to announce what that backstage comment was. No, I don't. I don't yeah, think we're, we're thinking on the same side, same lines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is a there is a similarity, I think. 
I, I thought it looked a bit phallic actually at one point as well. But uh, <laughs> I know why it's called hot dog because I am. I'm not phallic. Phallic. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not uh, <laughs> What well, I'm just coming on. Hoggy, great banter tonight. Thank you very much. It's been a great entertainment. Uh, really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, that's the first person who's given me a bit of grief. I quite like it, actually. That's, that's fair. Deserve it time as well. Uh, yeah, I deserved it. I deserved it 100%. So uh, I, I thank you for that. And I do mean that because that is brilliant. Um, I'm just going to uh, – that's the right uh, message, I think, Hoggy, yeah. Grill you know. Com. Please, please go on to that, guys, because it's looking pretty decent on there, um, and uh, it's worth worth a look, definitely. Um, I'm mad now. I guess wow. it, again <laughs> from me, Hoggy. Thank you very much for coming on our humble show. Please stay yeah. with us as we uh, um, go off air. We'll we'll just have a little chat offline. Um, but thank you for the moment, Hoggy. Fantastic, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you, guys. Um, Obviously, we're doing this for the the Lords Taverners. If we have enjoyed this this evening as much as I and, and K Dog have, then please do donate to the Mask Cricketer. Just go to the Just Giving page, search the Mask Cricketer, and it's there. And don't forget, it's your turn next week to hashtag Ask the Mask. And also, let's keep getting that Ask the Mask music trending we need that trending guys okay um but i think uh without sort of further ado i think i ought to just wrap it up tonight don't forget to join us again next tuesday evening seven o'clock facebook live and our youtube channel please subscribe if you haven't already and i'm doing the normal bo boring bits here but again thanks for watching and uh um kieran i hopefully you've got nothing to say I'm speechless. Oh, I'm going to uh, leave it there. It, it was brilliant. Um, nice to see everybody tonight. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next Tuesday. Hashtag Ask the Mask. See you later.